I finally just said to her, no matter who comes to see you or how you go about this, you are going to have to apply for a benefit. And in order to do that, you need to provide a social and you need to provide a form of payment. And until you are prepared to do that with someone that you trust, you will not have the benefit and your son will be in the exact same situation that you are in right now. And if you're okay with that, I'm okay with leaving. If you're not okay, I'll write up the application. There's no guarantee that you're even going to get this, but we do have to apply to get you started. Nope, nope. I said, I guess you're okay with not putting the benefit in place for your son. Thank you. I got up. She went to shake my hand. And I said, um, you're shaking my hand for what reason? <laughs> and she said, to thank, Dang, you for, to, right? to thank you for coming. I said, I want you to think about shaking your son's hand. Because one day, yours is not going to be there to shake his. And someone's going to have to do something. And I know that's a tough conversation for me to have with you. But that needs to, that needs to happen. Hello and welcome to episode 26 of the Life Insurance Academy podcast. I'm your host, Austin Lopes Silvero, and I'm here with Chris Ball, Zach McElwain, and Roger Short. The LIA podcast takes you into the conversations of top producing life insurance agents so that you can level up your business. For episode notes and resources, visit liapodcast.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Life Insure Acad. Also, make sure you've subscribed to our text notifications for episode releases and agent resources. All you have to do is send the letters LIA to the number 82149. That's 82149 in the message with the letters LIA. Thanks for joining us. If you've listened to more than one or two episodes of this podcast, then you'll know we often cover the importance of developing trust, need, and desire in the sales process. In today's episode, we discuss one of the biggest reasons agents struggle in this area, and that is the ability to have tough, authentic conversations with clients. So let's listen in as we discuss why we need to have these conversations, some mistakes agents make while having them, and some of the best practices to really have these tough, authentic conversations. This was uh, one of the key things that I had to learn when I got started in sales. Um, I remember, Roger, uh, you and I had a conversation where I uh, had said that I felt like I was just getting by on my on my personality. Like, oh, I'm just I'm getting by with connecting with people, and uh, I could be engaging. I liked to talk to people, uh, but um, I realized there was a sales skill that I had to learn. And also, I had forgotten about this. I had an encounter with an agent who really challenged the way I thought about things. He just kept asking me these questions. Why, 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 why? It's like talking to a kid, you know? (laughs) But uh, he had introduced me to a book. And if you don't have this book, I highly recommend it, especially if you have a personality like mine. Um, But it was Fierce Conversations by Susan Scott. Uh Very good book. Very good book. And in that book, she had talked about coming uh, behind the conversation, like getting to the heart of a conversation uh, with, with bra- <laughs> it's just funny, brave bravery, like being brave, which seems silly to some people. Like Roger, I'd imagine being brave in a conversation probably isn't a big deal <laughs> when you're selling something. <laughs> when I was you. younger, it was. <laughs> yeah. Probably not so much now. Yeah. No. Yeah. Mm-mm. And that's and that's what it was for me, like understanding that there were some things that had to be talked about that I wasn't comfortable talking about. And I think there's a lot of people who feel that way. Some are charming and engaging, and uh, you know they're the life of the party. Some people are informative, and they like to educate people. But they, it's probably most people just aren't super comfortable talking about things that people don't like talking about. I got a funny story about that. What well, kind of um, do tell? Do you 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 don't know this about me, but. I don't like selling stuff. <laughs> I don't. Like you say it on every podcast. No, I'm not talking he about. He does insurance. say it on every podcast. <laughs> I'm, ta- I'm not talking about insurance. Stuff. I'm talking about if I have any items at home, I won't post anything on marketplace. I will pay my brother or somebody to sell items for Your me. Your grandma sells. I paid my grandma 
to sell things for me. <laughs> she sells what? Jordans? Isn't that true? That's a fact, guys. She I know, she sells I know. Uh, shoes, watches, whatever. She's flipping Yeezys. She's, she's, she's got an eBay store. Yeezys. But like, <laughs> I've never wanted that. And it, a lot of this is I didn't want to deal with the negotiation. I didn't want to, to bicker with people. And honestly, I didn't want to have my personality. I didn't want to have any of these types of conversations with people about buying and selling, which is crazy to, to say because, you know, I guess I just didn't believe in it or or what, but... You know, I just didn't want to. I just didn't want to mess with it. Why? Why do you have to be able to be comfortable to have these tough conversations? I mean, like Chris said, you have to be brave in it. Um, you know, because if you really believe in what you do, um, you have to be able to uncover the value. Um, and it's you have to. You don't have to be comfortable when you start doing it. But you you will become comfortable because you get used to asking those questions um, and, and you start to see the results. And I'm not talking about results in apps. Yes, that comes later. But the results in the level of connection that you reach with your client and the understanding and you get rewarded by watching somebody, you can physically see them start to trust you. Their shoulders get loose. They start to relax. Their wall comes down. Um, and, and the result of that is asking those deeper, um, more than surface level conversations, um, more than just the yes and no questions. You know, tell me about your, how often do you get to see each other? That's not a yes, no question. Do you get to see them? Yes. Yeah. Well, how often? Yeah, I kind of talk about it like seeing the real person, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and in some cases, it's, uh, it feels like, People have their dukes up. Dukes, you know what I'm talking about. Does people know? Do people know what I'm is, is talking this about? Like a 15th century reference from last <laughs> episode. <laughs> I, it's funny because hear like, ye, you, hear ye, lower you, ye, dukes. When you say something, you want to do the physical motion, and nobody can see it. You know, so you know I you guess, have your man. fists in front of you, like and, you know, you put them up. Say yeah, yes, that's it. That's <laughs> right, that's right the audio put version. Put them up. See. And, uh, and they're yeah. doing one of these. Yeah. <laughs> See, Roger's putting his fists. Old, I'm describing it. Putting his guys fists. Guys, they were the, the really short shorts and the really small boxing gloves back in the day. But yeah. dancing it kind around of the ring. feels that way. And. You see them start to put their dukes down and relax, and you can see the real person. Before, all you saw was the fists, you know? That's all you saw in front of you. So uh, This is more authentic conversations at this point, right? Authentic, yeah. Yeah, which we'll get to some of that, but what what can be tough? Also, being able to um, address real need. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're not willing to have a real authentic conversation, a tough conversation, you can't... You can't get to the need. I honestly, I've learned, and I feel like this was a huge learning point for me. Every sale has a pain point. Every single one. Otherwise, we wouldn't be selling something. Correct. Yeah. And if there isn't the point of pain, then you didn't solve a problem. Mm-hmm. I, I think another thing that needs to be addressed in here, which we might not be saying, and we might not have said it yet, but. I think there's some people that are only comfortable with surface level conversations. They don't even ever get to authentic, right. <laughs> let alone a more challenging conversation yeah. that uncovers need. I mean, we're programmed as social beings to, what do we talk about? The weather, the day, was- sports, and what you do for a living and where you live. I mean, it's, and anything beyond that, it's like, hey, so how's your marriage? Whoa. You just, you just <laughs> That's went, generally you just, Roger's door knock question. You just, went, you just went too far. How's your retirement savings going? Who do you invest with? What? What? What's happening to your 401k? Since, like, that's like, that's another level. And we're programmed not to go there. Right. It's like, it's, it, these are taboo conversations in social protocols. And so a lot of people are just never comfortable getting beyond the surface. Right. So when even when we refer to some of our acronyms and building trust, C O R E, children occupation, recreation emotion, sometimes even our agents want to move through the just so tell me about your children. So what do you do for a living? So what do you like to do for your hobbies? Okay. Um, I see you need some life insurance. Let's talk about that and see when we get you qualified for. I mean it's uh, they Yeah, want, Valerie talks about the small talk and the, you you're not getting anywhere with small talk. No. I mean in in that episode we talked about drilling deep into core and and why spending time there is more important sometimes yeah. than the trans and then the presentation. Yeah. I mean, this is important, but you have to be willing to have the tough conversation. 
and uh, dive in. I think it was Susan Scott. She also wrote that book, Fierce Leadership, right? Correct. Yeah, I think it was her that said it's not the genuine conversations that we should dread, but the surface level conversations. Yeah. Because how much time are we wasting in life having surface conversations that mean nothing, that accomplish nothing? It's just... It's just passing time. It impacts nothing. It moves the needle at zero. And it's not those, it's not the genuine conversations we should dread. It's the ones that are of no substance. I think once we come to the, the realization that selling is uncovering needs, which means diving into people's reality, your reality, and being transparent, you know, now you can start to bridge the gap, at least to go from surface to authentic, you know, and have yeah. an authentic conversation. But I even think there's distinctions there to go further. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing and the, and again, being able to see um, the real person, the real person and, and their need, their desire. The other great thing about this conversation, guys, like I really like is I think this isn't just a sales thing. It's it's a thing that we're trying to figure oh out gosh. personally. Yeah, it's I, a life thing. I've been learning this a whole lot lately. Oh, do tell. <laughs> oh, we're not. That is not this podcast. <laughs> but you, you do have to be able to have the hard conversations and, and share, truly share what you're genuine feeling and being able to ask them. And you might not get the response that you want, you know. Right. Well, I remember, uh, again, my experiences being so nervous and and Roger you gave an example of this when uh, you would do the soft close I'm assuming that if we could find something that's affordable for you that you know would take care of uh, Rick Tammy whoever then that's something you'd at least want to apply for to see if we can get you covered right right yeah yeah right the example you gave in a previous podcast was Rick saying you know well uh, if we if it's something we could afford Right, and I've I've heard this many times, but for me, um, and that's just an example. One example, the finance one is one example. But I'd hear something, and I'd like red alert, red alert. You know, objection coming. Yeah. <laughs> move away from this conversation. <laughs> it's about to get uncomfortable. <laughs> yes, move away. Warning, Will Robinson. And I would um, I would just like pretend I didn't hear it. Like, and I would just move forward. If you could see my hand, I would move forward. Zach's got the sound effect. Yes. And uh, <laughs> pretend I did not hear anything in regards to something that needed to be addressed. And it took me a while to to learn the importance of, like you said last week, it was, I don't know if it was last week, but in our previous one of the thousand podcasts that we have. <laughs> 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 but you you had said, no, no, wait a second. Oh, that's why I said if we could find something affordable to you because you're not going to pick something that's not affordable. Like, right. Like slam on the brakes, address it. Like yeah. uh, that. doing that, man, just my personality and my makeup and, you know, who I am, people, pleasing, connecting, like ability, you know, just felt so weird. That was a, a learning curve for me. But mm-hmm. it all comes back to... We as the agents understand the value of what we do. We've seen the effects. And if you're a new agent, you've heard the effects yeah. of, of not them not having these policies. So you know the value. And by knowing the value of, of what we do, you know we have to dive into that. We have to have those tough conversations. So um, what are some, some mistakes agents make uh, of either not having this conversation or that keeps them from getting there. I do want to address the one I think Roger had mentioned a little earlier is that keeping things surface level and, and being present in, in the, the conversation, not the, just the sales process. Like what does that sound like? Um, Sounds like a bad marriage if you're not present. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> well, in the conversation. conversation. <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> marriages that fail, people are not present, and they never take time to hear the other person. And then, How was your day? Good. Yeah. Well, even like... I don't want to talk about it. I'd say a great yeah. example is the cell phone. You know, you're in a conversation, and then this person's on their cell phone, and you're like, are you even listening to me? Mm-hmm. Now, I know our agents aren't 
<laughs> who knows? They <laughs> might be. I hope not. <laughs> yeah, hopefully an agent who's listening isn't on his cell phone like, oh, really interesting, you know, playing Tetris. Double tap. Whatever, <laughs> you know. Or but, they're reading their email. But I do know that agents who don't know their flip chart read the entire flip chart without making eye contact. You're talking about the presentation piece. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. I know without making eye contact. Yeah, it's so <laughs> unnerving to watch it from the outside. It's like, what is that person doing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're so into themselves right now because they don't know their stuff. They're no longer connecting. So that's an issue of not being present, or an example of an agent who um, isn't in dialogue, having good questions, good connecting points, paying attention to their surroundings. And I, I do remember sitting with a, a client who who had, um, her her husband had passed and uh, she had a, I guess it was like a suit jacket holder. You know what I'm talking about? Like it kept it from being wrinkled. You could put the suit jacket around it and there was a trucker hat on top, a cane leaning against it and there was another piece and this was in the living room. It wasn't the bedroom. It was in the Mm -hmm. living room and the agent was like, again, you know, like through core, just... Boom. Road. Oh, ring. do you have any kids? Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Interesting. What did you do? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Never thought to ask about what is that yeah. hanging in your living room? <laughs> right. And I just, you know, I said, you know, Mrs. Smith, that looks like that's something that's important to you. You can tell me a little bit about it. And boom. You know, Dukes came down, emotion. There's Duke. all this <laughs> this conversation. <laughs> and uh, that's just being an issue of being present. I just want to give that as an example. Mm. Because Chris, do you I think remember, so I think the first time me and you ever rode together, we were in Columbus, Indiana. Yeah. We went and ran an appointment mm-hmm. and the clients were trying to get they us to They were trying roll. to move us forward. I yeah, remember this. The whole yeah. time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember I made a comment. I looked over my shoulder and saw a folded up American flag in a frame. Mm-hmm. Um, asked them about that. And they hopped up from the table went over there and grabbed it, brought it over, and told us the entire story of his grandpa. Yeah. Um, the whole sit changed from that moment. Yeah, he was and like that a was boxer like, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was one of the I best. I still remember it. Yeah, he was one of the best uh, fighters. I don't know if he was a Marine or he was in some, um, you know, some... Military branch. Military branch. And so what they would do on their free time is they would box, and they had a full ring and everything, and he was so proud of this because he was the number one boxer and they would actually go wherever they're at and fight the other military's best boxers. So it was like their own like league almost. And they would be these huge like fights and have them in the ring. And uh, it was just such a cool story. And it meant so much to them. And it meant so much to them that we asked about it that, you know, uh, it just it just calmed the whole sit down and took it to another level. And the crazy thing was is, we were, I mean, me and Chris are both seasoned agents and we are doing everything to try to, because you know, you feel it when it's different. When yeah. you connect, you feel it. And we weren't feeling it. And we were about 15, 20 minutes in, which is a miracle on this couple because they were just trying to get to it from the beginning. And and time stopped. Once you find that piece, time stops. But you have to be willing. Yeah. Yep. You have to be willing. Um. And I, here, I guess here's a tell, a little tell, and I've seen this happen before. I think uh, the being present portion of this, uh, you can pay attention to your your questions and your answers. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've seen agents who are asking questions, and they will say, "Great, awesome, great, awesome. It's great, great, awesome, awesome. Whatever the the cadence, <laughs> awesome, <is>. awesome, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Those are the wrong questions, right? And I, I, I'm not joking. I actually heard this from an agent who was was going through the, this process and having this conversation. And uh, a, a lady had talked about somebody who'd passed um, during our set, and and he said, "Awesome," and moved on to the next question. Oh boy! And and I was did the, did the client catch it? They didn't catch it. Oh, they well, didn't catch I mean, it. it. Right, that's like, well, I was like, "Praise oh. the Lord!" Right? That that well, was he a didn't catch I mean, it that's either. A, that he, that's a moment <laughs> overall. <laughs> Bad, everything bad. Right. I mean, warning signs mm-hmm. from his end and theirs because like, they're not engaged. They don't. They don't care. Yeah, I mean, that and shows you the care. level. Yeah, Nobody level cared. of engagement from the client and from him, and he was the one who was directing that conversation. So it was on him at that mm-hmm. point. And 
and not an acknowledgement. It was greater awesome moving forward and uh, just steamrolling, just poosh, you know. I don't know what engine noise that was, but it's steamrolling. <laughs> Sound like a tugboat just came <laughs> off and now? just dropped oh, into the water. That's, that's what I'm I can guarantee. One thing steamboat. that happened <laughs> yes. in the car, he had a tough conversation. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, there was a tough. And conversation. you were interrogating his reality <laughs> that, at that moment. Very good. That is about a Susan him Scott not statement. being present. Yes, in 100%. the moment. And you had his attention because you were being present <laughs> in the moment. Yes. If you're wondering if you ever do this, think about the response that you give to your clients. If they're yes or no then you're probably doing the same thing as that agent did. If questions aren't coming into your head based on their response, yeah, and, and you not, might not be asking the right not question. Not the mm-hmm. next question. It's the follow-up question that shows that said, you have interest. Yours. Yeah, like you like that you're so interested that you want to know more about that, their career, their family. What's you know? Do they ever have a family reunion? What was it like? They play games. I mean, it needs to be diving deeper questions and not next questions. Next questions. <laughs> I have no idea where you're going. I don't know what that is. There was a Zig Ziglar talks. About, he talks about if you don't know what to say for the next question, just repeat the last statement as a question. <laughs> so I was giving it a shot. Next questions? Bit. Next questions? Well, if you're asking questions that only elicit a yes or a no answer, right. mm-hmm. those are not good questions. Those are not the right questions. Correct. Like, ask good questions, listen intently, and follow up with more good questions. Yes or no, save that for the health qualification. I mean, yes, it, that, that is <laughs> in agreement in stereo. We're with you on that. Yep. A lot of this comes from um, just lack of confidence that, that people have. They, they, they're not confident in being or speaking from a position of authority in this area. They're transitioning into the business uh, maybe their own financial situation is not exactly right. Maybe their um, own insurance uh, needs are not taken care of properly. They're into this business because they want to make a living, because they found themselves looking for another career opportunity, because COVID took their job, whatever the situation might be. They didn't graduate from university wanting to you know, become a life insurance advisor at that point. And they're now in here, and so because of some of that... Uh, lack of confidence, they're just uncomfortable with going there because they don't know how to address some of these things. So they avoid it. It's, yeah. it's like the weird water cooler. It's like the, the middle schooler at the dance. Not confident. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All the all the party girls are out there dancing with themselves and all the boys are on the side going, I wish I was out there dancing. <laughs> you know, and that's that's kind of how that rolls. And when you're not confident, you, you don't you don't get a you don't get a good result. This is something that I have learned throughout my time in this on sales. the dance floor, oh. Oh. <laughs> dude, <laughs> dude, <laughs> you don't want to see that. Uh, during my my sales journey, is and this the hope this blanket statement doesn't hurt people's feelings, but this is a fact that most people are waiting to be told what to do. Most people, and I think people are entering into this, and they're used to having a boss who will say, "Hey, uh, go do this," or "Where are those reports?" or you know, um, I, whatever bosses point and tell people to do. You've you know? not had a boss in the wild. <laughs> they stand up when others are sitting yeah, down. Yes, they stand up when others are sitting down, things like that. And now they're in this this position and the people they're sitting with are waiting to be directed. Yeah, and, you're the professional. Yeah, yeah. You're the one that understands and knows this. You're they the boss. Know what. You're the boss. You're the boss. Yeah. yeah. Figuratively speaking, in yeah. their home, you're the you're the authority, you're the point of authority, you're there to answer their questions. So some of those that that was a realization for me as well, like personally for me, um, and how I had to approach this uh, as someone who was directing and asking questions and challenging thought processes and moving people forward towards a solution that I saw, and then for them as well. I think um, another one of those areas is. Um, the idea of selling is never been taught as asking good questions, uncovering the need, and then meeting the need with a good solution. Do you think people experience that very often? Experience what? Selling as being taught and looking for a solution versus being told. I think most people experience selling, they have a reason. I, I guess what I'm saying is they, 
they think it's a certain way because they've had experiences that solidify that thinking. I think some people are just shown a pattern mm -hmm. that has worked to some level of success, mm -hmm. and they just duplicate that. Yeah. And they're not actually thinking about why it works or what about it makes it work, other than the fact that someone at some point requested information about this, so there must be some need. So I'm just going to plow through this and find out what we can qualify for, find an affordable price, and on to the next one. Um, like the master sellers in this world, in the universe of sales, will always tell you that the best salespeople are truly not salespeople. They're advisors, they're consultants, they're co-buyers, so to speak, where they help people get what they want. They never sell them what they think they might need. It's, it's helping someone get something that they need badly and helping them having a dialogue with them about it and coming to a consensus. But you're leading the conversation in the direction where it needs to go and you haven't been taught bad habits by someone else. So if you've been taught some bad habits and you're just trying to get through a presentation to get to the end, to get the sale, to get the small talk out of the way, to get to the presentation, to get to the app, you're probably not going to have a long-term career. You will burn out because you miss the true value of what it means to uncover a real family need and then meet it and then have that family go, we really appreciate what you did for us. This mattered. You'll run into it sometimes in, inadvertently and then you kind of use it as a benchmark. So this worked once, so I'll just duplicate that. And that's the worst thing that yeah. can happen to someone that's new is they kind of get lucky or they get right. what we call the laydowns. Well, and that's what was my deal. Like before I noticed something had to change, it was just getting lucky with... Just talking I, about buttercream cake. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that was it. And never getting to real tangible conversations. Yeah, it's the, the you're never coming out from behind your yourself into that real conversation that needs to take place. You're just kind of relying on your old way of doing things, your old habits, your own comfort zones, even as, you, as it relates to your personality. Sometimes personalities play into this. People sometimes are uncomfortable with their own finances, their own their own family situation. So I certainly can't talk to other people about it when I don't have my own in order. I think it's amazing what happens. What you may think is uncomfortable is just the unknown, right? So the yeah. not knowing part. But as the minute you wade into that, it's like refreshing and it opens up like a new freedom that it's like, wow, this wasn't so bad. And look what happens when I have a genuine conversation. Like, good things come out of that. Like, Those are level ups, man. Yeah. Like, think about even as a staff or the people you work with, when we have these genuine, authentic conversations about real issues, like, it creates really good dialogue. And everybody walks away feeling better every time, right? It makes you think and you chew on it for a little bit. And then you come back a few days later and you talk about it. But it's those are growing. You, you, Chris, you talked about a, in a previous episode, like you can't be in this business no and way. not be committed to personal growth. So if you're listening today and you're expecting to have success without personally growing, without getting uncomfortable into some waters that you've never waded into before, like you're going to have a short-lived career. You have to start moving into those areas. And maybe it's just the, the idea of having the conversation with some people you trust about your own finances and your own insurance needs. Because that will help you maybe get some questions answered for you, which then leads to more confidence when you're dealing with others. Like that's where a mentor group comes in. That's where someone that you trust in your life, the accountability people in your life, that where they come in and can speak to you. I mean, we again, we talked to a group of agents this morning. And we said, you know, like the two things that are going to impact where you are five years from now is the content you consume on a daily basis, whether that be reading, videos, podcast content, stuff you listen to, news, stuff you digest, ingest, consume. And number two, the people you associate with and what they feel about life, what they know, their experiences, how they can share their experiences with you. You know, um, And if you find those accountability people in your life, now you have some solutions to your own situations, which gives you confidence then to move into those conversations with others. So I would encourage you to get some of those people in your life. And if you need some resources or some people that we can point you to, reach out. We'd be, we'd be happy to give you some advice on that. When an agent tells you that their client can afford it, what are the questions that you dive into to 
figure out and train them. Yeah, I mean, it happens quite often. That's the number one excuse everybody gets. That doesn't mean it's the real reason or it's an accurate reason why they can't afford a policy or buy a policy. It's just the number one go-to because they don't want that responsibility on themselves saying, I don't want to take care of my family, I don't value it enough, or you haven't brought enough value to me to see that I really need this. They just say, I can't afford it. It's not on you, it's on their money. But even if that is the excuse we can kind of expose that. And this is where that tough conversation comes in. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to dive in and say, Mr. Phil, uh, I think you're, you're, you're full of a horse poopy, okay? <laughs> because uh, you have, uh, you know, hear because of that. all of this, right? Um, we want to ask questions and work through them, work through a budget with him if he really thinks affordability is the reason here. And trust me, it's generally not. Even though they have a very tight budget, it's about 90% of the time, it's not the real reason. And let me say this. that Again, a big learning moment for me when I realized, oh, people who have 800 to 1600 to $2,000 of Social Security, they can afford life insurance. They can afford a burial plan or a cremation plan or something to take care of their final expenses because... What is the alternative? GoFundMe. Right. <laughs> Broke we, family. We no, see this. The, the, Broke yeah, the family. They don't have GoFundMe. They, uh, I would, I would, I would imagine they never use it. But when, when, you, like, when you're diving into their finances, and you have to think about this all starts at the beginning. is everything we do, every single one of these podcasts ties together. You have to have that trust, them, them genuine conversations, the authentic conversations um, you know, taking your time when you're building that core to dive into the motion because at the very end of that, that relationship is what allows you to dive into the tough conversation at the, at the end, meaning you, you they trust you um, and you're showing empathy towards them and their budget and you're asking questions you're not telling them. So you gently want to work through a budget with them. And I may know that Phil's over here smoking two packs of cigarettes a day at five bucks a pop, which is – Quite a bit of money on a monthly basis. That's like seventy thousand dollars a month, right? Yeah, you know, three hundred. Very good at math. Three hundred. Yeah, oh, so that's way off. It's it, it's quite a bit of money a month, and that's accurate. That's a lot of our clients that we see uh, around here. That I mean, that's kind of what they do, but they may not realize that. They may not ever. They never have, put pen to paper. They never put pen to paper, and they never have the tough conversation with themselves on, "Hey, these are my life choices." This is what I choose to prioritize over my family. Now, I'm not saying that's what they want to do, but if they never talk to themselves about it, if they never think about it, then that's what they're already doing. So in a nice way, talking about the love of their family and and the value of protecting their loved ones um, and kind of nicely exposing it um, of how much and their priorities in their budget, it reveals some changes that they're able to make. Once again, I'm not saying do this, do that. They start to see where they're spending their money, how they're spending their money, and if they really want to make sure and, and if they think this is important enough for their family, meaning they value it enough, hint, that's our job to build the value, not at the very end of the sit, but throughout, um, then they start to see, um, wow, well, I, I guess I can, instead of smoking two packs, I can smoke a pack and a half and put another $80 policy in place to protect my granddaughter. You know, things become, um, you know, really important. And the power of having the tough conversations when it comes to finances is it allows them to see, you know, basically how, they, how much they value their family and that they are able to make slight adjustments in order to protect their loved ones. Interestingly, like you sit with some younger families um, who are looking at a traditional life policy or a mortgage protection plan, and you're kind of getting the vibe of the pushback or one party's not really buying in, and you're trying to have this uncomfortable conversation, and and you can see the things around them. When you pulled in, there was a boat on a trailer out back with a cover over it, you know, so you know that they boat on the weekends somewhere. There might be a, a motorcycle sitting there in the garage that you saw. And they're in a home or a refinance home that they just refinance, or it might be a new mortgage. Um, if it's a refinance situation, they've got all these things around them. Like, 
there's probably a pretty good opportunity there that they pulled some equity out to cover some of those purchases because they were overextended slightly, and that's just a way to pay off some of those other external debts. And like these are things that can be addressed and discussed. Like when you're in one home, you can let them know, you know, like when I sit with some families, Mr. and Mrs. You know, Walker, um, I, I notice that people prioritize the things that they really want. And they'll go make a purchase for something that they can enjoy for several months of the year, like a, a bike or a boat or a cottage or, or something, a swimming pool and wh- whatever that might be. And uh, the next thing, they're refinancing their homes to pay for these things. So now, now the, the boat has a 30-year mortgage on it and they're financing it at, a, at an interest rate that over the course of that 30 years, that boat costs them like two or three times what they thought they were paying for that boat. But that's where their value was. And when we break down the cost of a, a policy of putting protection in place for your family, it protects all those things and the things that you may want to value for your children, those schools that you want to go to, college, universities, the experiences you want to have about them being on a sports team or not being able to, tr- to travel on a sports team, to be able to you know, have a car that can help them get through high school so we don't have to carpool them the whole time and you're helping them pay for that. Or what happens if something were to happen to you or your spouse and you're not able to work and provide the way you did before. Oftentimes people don't think about those things, but they always prioritize the things that they want. And so there's a dollar associated with that. So as we are sitting here and talking to you guys, I can tell that it's a priority for you to make sure these other things are taken care of. Tell me about why these things are important for you guys. Wow, dude, that is gold. Like, you should record that. <laughs> I think <laughs> like we just should. Thank you. No, I'm yeah, telling you guys, works. like, that should be on a podcast. Like, we should make that happen. <laughs> Can we do that, Austin? I'll talk to the producers. <laughs> <laughs> so what you've done now is you've set a stage for where they're putting their money. It allows you to have a, a, a the conversation and then it allows them to respond about what's important to them and why. But it takes away some of the excuses of what they may give you or what one spouse may give you because in some homes you can see one, va- one spouse is really valuing why you're there and wanting to move forward and the other one is resistant. Sometimes you need to bring that other spouse along by making the, 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 um, the accommodating spouse or the spouse that's kind of like your ally, bring them together so that they become an, uh, an ally buyer and uh, bring the other spouse with you uh, into the direction of the value that she's seeing or that he's seeing that the other one does not. And the, the uh, interesting picture there, I know that moment for a new agent who is like seeing it, like they see the truth. They see it and they have their butterflies in their stomach because they're like, I have to say something about the second mortgage and the boat and, and all this stuff, and you're first. You're gonna make mistakes. It's okay. You're gonna make mistakes. I, I remember the nicest agent in the world uh, could connect with people. Would get out in the car, call me, and say, "Chris, uh, they said they want to do business with me with me sometime, just not today." You know, well, I got another one. I got another one. I got another one. But they really liked me, and they said, "Well." Someday you're going to get hungry enough to actually sell something. <laughs> oh my God. You're going to get hungry enough to ask them some real questions. Yes. At some point, you're going to get hungry enough to actually ask them some tough questions. You're, you are way too nice. You're, and it, it wasn't even a nice issue. Maybe that's not the right way to say it, but too accommodating to their present reality and not helping them see the future, you know, because you know the future, you know how this is going to end. And you have to speak with some urgency to it or ask some questions that lead to some urgency to it. So I know that moment. I know those feelings. And I want to say this. They, they think they're being nice, right? Mm-hmm. But <coughs> the reality is, it's not that they're worried about being nice to them. No. It's worrying about how, they, how uncomfortable they are with having, the que- <laughs> with having that conversation. The agent. Yeah, the agent. Mm-hmm. They're, they're not as concerned about being nice or not nice. Right. Well, They're think, concerned about this makes me feel really awkward and I'm not comfortable. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, hey. Well, I, I guess they don't want it. I, you know, we were walking through this alley and I lost my keys in there. And uh, someone comes along and there's three people outside on the sidewalk where, there's, where the street light is. 
and they're out there looking for the keys. What are you doing? Well, we're looking for the keys. Well, where'd you lose them? In the alley. Well, why aren't you in there looking for them? Because it's really dark and it's <laughs> uncomfortable and I'm scared in there. So we're looking out here. Like it, it makes, yeah. like they're going away from something to get something easier, but it doesn't make any sense. So not having the tough conversation uh, does not allow you to move forward. It allows you to remain nice. Yeah. And you'll get another one. You'll get, an, like Chris said, you can never move forward unless you're You'll get a lot it. of vegetables from the garden. You're a really nice guy. We'll call you when we're ready. Here's some veggies to take home. Yeah. <laughs> some, like, sometimes it's difficult. To, how do I start to do that? Um, what do I need to do to Great have question. these tough conversations? Or how do I move forward? Well, the first thing is, is forget about your client. Because it's not about them. It's not. Dang. Roger just said they're thinking about themselves. That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. It's, it's I'm not. so confused. Yeah. It, it's not. It's about it's about their beneficiary. It's about the family oh. it's impacted. It's yeah, about it's, right. it's about the spouse that's sitting about the there ones quiet, they love, right? Right, dude. That you just flip some tables I've been, there. I've been telling her to him to stop smoking for years. You know, it, it's about that. Yeah, you've been saying you want to quit, anyways. You know that you know that little voice. It's about that granddaughter sitting in the room watching TV at her, at her grandparents' house. It's about everybody else but the person you're talking to. And, and the tough thing is, you have to get them to see that. You have to get them to see that, um, but you have to believe it as an agent first. If not, you're there trying to sell. Whenever you try yep. to sell, you're selling to the client when it's never about the client. It's just building a value for that beneficiary that you may or may not ever speak to, but that one day if you do the right thing and you are able to present that value, you might get a call from that beneficiary thanking you. You've never met them. But thinking you and thinking you, uh, you were sent from God to protect their family, because Phil's never let anybody else in the house, and he's never talked to them, and he said he'd never buy insurance. That I've been telling him to buy insurance for years, um, and for some reason he really liked you, and he and he trusted you, and and he put a plan in place. So I thank you for that. I've literally had death claims thanking me because their father was so stubborn about doing these things that people are never going to die. When the reality is, you know, it, it's it's about those other people that you may or may not ever meet. So another part of the discomfort level is uh, being uncomfortable with beer, right? They're yeah. afraid of if I do ask the tough question, then what? And I don't get the answer that I was looking for, or they don't respond like, there's the way a few I was hoping, options. or I get a no now. You're going to get or, a tough answer, mm-hmm. and it's going to be... It's going to be heavy. Austin, mm-hmm. I would take Option that every two. single time. Is this going to be silent? Yeah. In the silence. I mean, as a podcast host, <laughs> I can't stand silence. <laughs> it's dead air. I think people are afraid of silence. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the old adage, right, in sales, right? When you give your closing statement, shut up, Just close and stay closed. You've heard this before, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. First close one who talks, stay loses. Closed. The first one who talks loses. That's not always the best um, statement to, to consider because really if your product has value for that family and they speak first, they're not losing. It's not a game of winning or losing. It's really a game of winning or winning, mm-hmm. right? And so he who talks first loses. However, if you as a salesperson talk first, you will lose. You are losing um, because you become uncomfortable with the silence. As a podcast host, if it goes silent for a minute, it's like, uh, oh, tick, 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 tick. You can hear the clock ticking. Oh, it's like, yeah. are our audience tuning out because they think yep. they lost their feed? I mean, what, what any happened? sort of entertainment, like dead <laughs> air. Yeah. So in sales, though, man, there's power in silence. It is what some people would say the thing that does the heavy lifting. Yeah. Right? Let, let your silence do the heavy lifting for you and let them chew on it. And I don't know if it has to be during conversations where these there, there are these awkward silences. Um, but I do think it has to be in regards to uh, moments where they need to feel and own the need. When uh, we get to a point uh, of emotion and we're asking, why is that important to you? And it just sits there. Yeah, let it soak in like wine on the carpet. You know, when I, when I asked, <laughs> that's a great one. <laughs> Like but olive oil on the bread. That's right. When I ask this question, I'll say, why is that important to you? And they'll answer it. And 
in some cases, I just put my head down and nod for 45 minutes. <laughs> and then they wake me up. I'm just kidding. It's, it's not that long. But, you know, for just a couple seconds, just so I, they know I'm listening, I'm hearing them, I'm connecting to why it matters to them. Like those are all, those are all big moments. I know in our final expense conversations, you have both taught me some things. Oh. Because I've learned uh, some moments where you have said, it's important to make people realize what's about to happen if they're no longer there and help them see that. Help them see the real need. You know, Zach, I think you said, who's the person who's going to be left that's going to have to go to the funeral home to take care of this for you and your family? And how are they going to make those arrangements if you don't have this taken care of? Yeah. Where are they going to get the money? Yeah. Chris, you've always said... Help people put their spouse in the chair with the funeral director in the funeral home, right. planning that moment. What's that like? Their child, the spouse, their sister. What's whoever it like for them? Mm-hmm. And how does that make you feel about how you prepared for that moment? Because that's coming to all of us. Yeah. And are you prepared? Like helping people see that? Austin, that's a challenging conversation. Like could you walk into a home right now and ask somebody that you just met 35, 40 minutes ago that question? Right, it's a uh, yeah. If you connect, listen to that uh, trust building podcast, Austin, you'd be able to get it. And if I let it sit there and let you chew on it for a minute, and let you process it, this uh, this is ooh. right, <laughs> right. You you really have you to can think. Feel of, it. You can feel the tension, right? Yeah. You can feel it because then they're realizing he's he's wanting a, an answer. Hmm. What was the question? Oh. I don't think that would make me feel good at all. Yeah. So, yeah, there are moments you have to put the brakes and make sure they understand what either you're saying or understand what they're saying. Mm -hmm. There's, and there's two key things for me. I mean, I've learned so much about listening through the sales process. And, and one is giving them the opportunity to process and digest information, even on the education side. And then, on the other part of it, uh, give them the ability, the opportunity to find the words that they're looking for. I mean, I can't say, how does that make you feel? And when it gets quiet, say, probably doesn't make you feel very good, does it? <laughs> like, I can't. Yeah, you're stealing it from I, them. That Man, perfect word. I stole that from you. You stole just, your you own power. You just stole power. that from yeah. Chris. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You stole the power from them, from the moment. Yeah. Because that moment was theirs to answer. Yeah, it wasn't yours to interject because you slightly you became slightly uncomfortable with the silence. Yeah, and to me, that's a possibility of becoming a big fat chargeback because mm-hmm. I didn't give them the chance to own the moment. It may be about how much they want to put in place. It yeah. may be about whether they want to do anything at all. It may be about some uncomfortable decisions they need to make about their other spending to be able to prioritize this. Right, being able and, to. And, and and being there and, and literally watching them sometimes have an uncomfortable conversation with each other is even more awkward. How many times have you seen that happen? Oh, my gosh. They're like, well, we're going to have to do this and that. And I'm like, I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> right? And they're literally having a conversation that is very personal in front of you about why they need to go ahead and do this. And, so, and the wife's like, we can't afford that. And then the husband will step up and say, well, if we don't, this is what could happen. And I don't ever want you to be in that position. I care much, too much about you guys for that. So you may think it's a lot, but compared to how we spend our money on this, this is not a lot. And then all of a sudden, like, there's a reality check. Well, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, I get it. All right, I'm good with if, if you are. And the agent who jumps in oh, and says, hey, listen, why don't you just do this one? Why don't you just do this one? Because that seems like that'll work for both of you, right? Like they didn't give again, stole the moment, didn't give them a chance to own it. Mm-hmm. Now, I do want to clarify this is silence is good when we're trying to have these tough conversations, but there are moments when you don't want to create silence. So, silence is good for tough questions, emotional questions, and financial questions, but there are spaces, the spaces we don't want silence. And I think 
It's in uh, conversations, like when we're just having a regular conversation and transitions. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're in, if you're, if there's silences in your conversation because you're distracted, you're preoccupied, <laughs> you're not thinking, or you lose track of what you're even talking about, and you have to try to come back to it, or you're checking a text. Yes. And just a minute, uh, I'll come right back to you. He's looking at his phone, pretending yeah, to look, pretending at, his look phone. at my phone. <laughs> Yeah, I just had to check to make sure someone else's policy was going. Oh, good, I got the commission on that one. <laughs> that would be very, that would be very bad. That would yeah. be very bad. Like <laughs> those pauses, not good, right? Um, and I would say probably the biggest faux pas. There's a French word <laughs> or a French term. The biggest faux pas would be like waiting for permission. Yeah, just awkwardly waiting for them to say yes, we want to apply. Like. If you've done your work, you've discussed affordability and found a plan that works for them, don't awkwardly sit there in silence waiting for them to say, yes, it's okay, please write us an application. Like yeah. at that moment, it's all engines go, like move forward. You know, Obviously, you're not going to come out of the moment, but you're going to now move into the process of, you know, here's the solution to help you meet that need and you're going to move forward. So yeah, there's, you're not going to make awkward silence there. That would just be weird. But I've seen it happen. Yeah. Then some people don't want the final rejection, so they're yeah. awkwardly dancing around whether they should get out an application you, or start writing. Would you like me to fill out an application? <laughs> or you say something like, would $20 a month yes, be okay yes. for your budget? I remember that. <laughs> yes. I well, will never let you forget that. What is the toughest conversation you've had so far? How did How did it start? I took a call one time from a, a, um, a lady. She responded to one of our mortgage pieces, and there was no one to handle. And I just, I just grabbed the call, and it was a lady that was pretty desperate. I mean, she actually teared up when I was with her on the phone, and we set an appointment, two hours, two hours drive from here to get there. Oh, I set it up for an evening because I had a full schedule. Drove all the way out there, got out there, was proceeding. Her son, who she wanted the benefit for, came home while I was doing it. I then had to kind of retell the story of why I was there. And she just lost her husband within the last year. And he didn't. He had a, an application for a life insurance policy that was not signed. Really? They oh looked at gosh. a benefit and they did not follow through and Holy get it. Holy cow. And left her basically with nothing to, to take care of any household income needs or any living expenses or any final expense costs. And she was devastated. I mean, she broke down three or four times during the, the call during the, the, the presentation. And you would think this would have went, gone well. Oh, yeah, no question. And um, the son was there. And so like, I brought the son in on the conversation as much as I could. She wanted to make sure that this would never happen to her son. And if something happened, her son could keep their home. Mm-hmm. Because now he was living back with mom and helping take care of her since dad died and that sort of thing. And um, he had recently lost his job, and she was, it was the only son she had. You know, He was an adult, grown man, that probably could have had another job but didn't. And for whatever reason, we got into the discussion and it came about the money part. And she was like, nope, nope, I'm not giving any Social Security or any bank account information on any of this. And she locked up. I did everything in my power to try to help her see. I drove two hours out here to Mm -hmm. see you. You know, I wouldn't have spent this time. Like, this is who we are. Took her to our way. I mean, I did everything. I explained to the son. I said, I can't apply for the benefit without providing an intent to pay. Like, if you apply, like life insurance companies don't want to go through all the hoops without, without them knowing that you're, you're going to do this. And it got challenging, and she stood up and became confrontational. I finally looked at her and said, Miss Mary, you are letting your fear of something that happened to you with someone else impede you or prevent you from getting this benefit that you so desperately want for your son. Well, if that's how you're going to try to trick me and manipulate me, it just turned. I literally asked her son to step outside for a moment. I talked to her son. I, uh, you know, his name was John. I said, John, this is the scenario. This is the situation. I said, did I get everything right or am I missing something? Like, what is happening? And um, she's like, no, we'll think about it. I'll call you. I said, ma'am, at some point, you're going to have to move forward, right, with this. And she became irate. She, and then it was like personal, like, no, 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 you're just like everyone else. And it was like personal tax. I finally just said to her, no matter who comes to see you or how you go about this, you are going to have to apply for a benefit. And in order to do that, you need to provide a social and you need to provide a form of payment. And until you are prepared to do that with someone that you trust, 
you will not have the benefit and your son will be in the exact same situation that you are in right now. And if you're okay with that, I'm okay with leaving. If you're not okay, I'll write up the application. There's no guarantee that you're even going to get this, but we do have to apply to get you started. Nope, nope. I said, I guess you're okay with not putting the benefit in place for your son. Thank you. I got up. She went to shake my hand. And I said, um, you're shaking my hand for what reason? <laughs> and she said, to thank, Dang, you for, to, right? to thank you for coming. I said, I want you to think about shaking your son's hand. Because one day, yours is not going to be there to shake his. And someone's going to have to do something. And I know that's a tough conversation for me to have with you. But that needs to, that needs to happen. Now, there's a lot of context to that story. Yeah. Because of the time we spent getting to, right. to that point, two hours. Trust that was built. Two hours. Mm-hmm. stuff, And it all came unraveled over, and, and I did not know how to resolve it. And when it became personal, I had to tell her, I said, you're making this about me? And I said, it's not about me. It's something that was done to you at some point in the past. I don't know how to overcome that. Um, I've given you all of our contact information, but um, you're not going to have this benefit in place until you're prepared to do that. Yeah. I said, I'd love to help but it appears that you don't want to let me help you. So have a nice evening. She goes, well, we'll call you if you're interested. I said, I I can't come back out here. I can't come back out here. It won't be in the next two to three weeks. I said, so uh, at some point later, if you want to have the discussion, feel free to call our office, and we'll consider what we might be able to do from there. Have a great evening. That's a tough conversation. Yeah, yeah, it got Mm -hmm. tough. Uh, And, you know, some of that was me, you know, just having a reaction to that. But the son outside, he was he apologized because he knew how desperately his mom wanted to solve that situation. Yeah. But let something come in the way where I, I again, if those any, are probably the toughest ones. Yeah, because if anyone else, like if I was the manager or I was a an agency owner or something like that, and one of my new agents came, I go, "What did you do to destroy the trust?" <laughs> right. That would be what I would have said. Right. Like mm-hmm. you did something. Like mm-hmm. how did you betray the trust? Something happened, but there was some wound there. There was some wound there, mm-hmm. I, and I addressed it as best I could. I could not get her to move beyond that. I would be surprised if a new agent went to that level because the reason you had that tough conversation is because you've seen this play out multiple times before, and you knew as an advisor how bad she needed it for her family, mm-hmm. and you you went those extra levels. That's why you even felt comfortable having the conversation anyways. Yeah. You know, most people would have just left. Yeah, and and you know, on the flip side of that, I've had some very challenging conversations with some husbands. Okay, and it seems like it's gone in the direction of the man of the house, especially if I'm dealing with a husband and wife. Like the wife so desperately realizes they need some coverage and protection, and the husband comes in dragging his feet, kind of. And um, I've had some challenging conversations, and like there is clearly a big barrier in the room, and it just comes to a point. I remember this one specific situation where I just said, can I stop? I said, there is no point in me proceeding here. And he looked startled, and she was like, what's he going to say? I said, I don't have your attention, and I don't feel like you've bought into the idea that your wife feels like she needs insurance or protection for your family. And until you're on board together in this, I'm wasting my time. And I don't want to waste mine. I certainly don't want to waste yours. I have too much value for the relationship here, she clearly has a need, and she's trying to communicate it, and I feel like you're disconnected for some reason, and I'm not sure what that is. Have I done something that I've not answered your questions, or, or what else do I need to cover to make you, make you feel comfortable with how this benefit is going to solve this problem and give your wife the protection and assurance that she's looking for? And he just sat there and wouldn't look at me. <laughs> and, he w- and he was looking at the TV, which was turned down, but he was looking at it because I asked him to turn he wanted it down it earlier. To save him. <laughs> and he was just looking at the TV and like, I don't know what was on. It was in, it, it was in the evening because it was dark. And he just sat there. And he finally turned around and he said, my brother had insurance and it never paid out. And I feel like insurance is a scam. How do wow. I know you're not a scam? The conversation opened right up. Yeah. It allowed me then to, to actually address everything. Wow. What do you need to know? Here's what I can communicate. Tell me about your brother's situation. Mm-hmm. Help me understand what happened. And here's the assurances that I can give you. And at the end of the night, he was shaking my hand as I was going out the door. 
Thank you, man. Most people wouldn't have hung in there like that. I was being a butthole to you. <laughs> I tell well, you, you know, it was a t- it was a very tough. Yeah, one. but if I had not stopped, right, I, I would have just left. Well, I would have left, and nothing would have happened. Ninety percent of agents wouldn't have stopped. That woman would not have had coverage for right. her family. The important thing here is these tough conversations. They're not always, or they're, they're not what you think of arguing with somebody. It's just simply addressing the elephant in the room, mm-hmm, yeah. bringing the problem yeah. up now so we can right. deal with it before we get to the end, before it becomes a major issue or they're going to use it as an excuse to why they're not going to get it. And uh, like the same thing, like Roger, in those situations, I, I mean, I have like so many playing in my head where literally building core or transitioning or, or just starting the presentation that I didn't have their involvement. And I had to do the same thing. I had to bring them both there because what's the point in wasting my time and going through it um, to only come to the end and he's already made his decision up now unless I address it, unless I bring up the issue, unless I, and I don't want to say the word challenge, but unless I step Reveal. up. Yeah, step up to this, to this, to, to the issue, to right. what the real problem mm-hmm. is. And sometimes it made, hey, have you had a bad day? Right. You know, what, oh, what's going on? conversation. You know, and I think, you know, as a new agent or as an existing agent or somebody that is just uh, more of an introvert that don't like conversation or like, yeah, don't like conversations, but confrontation, (laughs) confrontation, um, you know, the, the important thing to remember is what do you have to lose? Because in these situations, which we've all been in these homes, if you don't address the elephant in the room, if you don't, um, realize they need it and are willing to have that work through that budget or have that tough conversation, what's going to happen? Nothing. Nothing's going to happen. You're going to leave. It's, you're not going to get, uh, you're not going to protect a family and you're going to move on to the next or you can address it and you can try to make a difference in that family. And the worst thing that can happen then is you leave and you don't get to protect a family and you're on to the next. But that's the only way to have a potential or a possibility of really figuring out who did this family wrong in the past? What is going on with them? Is it a bad day? Is it trust issues? Um, you know, what's happening? Find that real need, address it now, earn their respect and trust because every time I've done this, I've earned their respect and trust because I've cared enough to look them in the eye and figure out what's going on. And they all become your best friends. And those those policies are the ones that stick. The ones you have... The you know that you you kind of get challenged on, and you don't bow down or lay down. Those are the ones that stay forever because you really develop a bond because you care enough about their family that you're willing to go to bat for their family, and you're bat and you're going against them at the right. same time. But once they can see your true intentions, it's it's perfect. The uh, great question you asked Zach was, "What is there to lose?" And this is this is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, everything, everything, because this is what I learned about myself, and this is where Roger said, you know, um, you can't do this business and not grow. That if I was willing to let it go in the sales process, then I probably was letting it go in other areas of my life. Like I was letting it go in my finances conversations, my finance conversations with my wife. I was letting it go with certain things with my kids. I was letting it go with certain things with my coworkers. There was just this level of something that needed to change and I was uncomfortable, but I wouldn't lean into it. And if your next sit to today, your next sit and you're thinking, man, I just, I don't want to say you seem to be having a bad day or are you having a bad day? and having that conversation, then you're going to go home and probably do the same pattern in your life. And I, I remember those conversations I've had with clients. I had a, a, a senior gentleman I was sitting with, and um, I had set the appointment at the door. Super nice dude. I came back, and he was a completely different guy. And I said, Mr. Jones, I, just, I have to stop, and I have to ask you, are you okay? Did something happen? Did I do something to offend you? because you seem like you're, you're having a bad day. And he said, I apologize to you. Before you got here, I was driving through the parking lot at um, Kroger, and these two kids cut me off. And I honked at them, and they flipped me off. And he started to shake. And he was like, if I was 20 years younger, 
Oh my gosh. It was sad. Like it really connected with me. I was like, like, um, you could see the, you know, the, the age you could see Mm. that he, he was feeling his age, you know, Mm. and was losing and felt a little powerless in that situation, but it opened a door to conversation, you know, but I think an agent would be avoiding eye contact. A lot of agents or me at the beginning would avoid eye contact and just keep moving through the presentation. Like, well, I guess I got to get through this one. Right. Mm, Yeah. So tolerate. Yeah. Tolerate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You got to engage, engage, even if it's tough. And I think the sooner you start doing that, you practice your engagement muscles. Yeah. And mm-hmm. once you wade into the, some of those conversations, you realize that doors do open and it's okay. It is a safe space as long as you create it to be such and uh, be okay with answers that you don't have or questions that you don't have answers for. It's okay. You don't need to know all the answers. Yeah. The, the fact is you're asking good questions and those good questions open up conversations and good conversations lead you to a, a, an area where you can now move into uh, providing a real solution for that family. Well, that's a wrap for today's episode. We challenge you to have the tough conversations and let us know what they are. Just visit the show notes. You'll be able to comment there and also see everything we talked about today, some of the books that we reference and some of the resources that we have available to agents. Just visit liapodcast.org slash EP25. That's liapodcast.org slash EP25. As always, thanks so much for listening to the Life Insurance Academy podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. Rate us five stars and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Life Insure Acad. The Life Insurance Academy podcast is hosted, edited, and mixed by me, Austin Lopes Silvero. This episode was produced by Chris Ball and myself. Our theme song is by Flashing Lights. We'll see you on another episode. Until then, stay safe and go be a difference maker.